want to welcome you all this morning to the Quicksilver Independent Methodist Church. For those that are here in the service, we thank you for your presence and we do pray for the Lord's help and blessing. And to those that are listening on YouTube, our thoughts and prayers are continually with you. This being Remembrance Sunday, we're going to give thanks to God for those who give of their lives during the two great world wars and also in the more recent troubles here. And we do remember in prayer all those that have been afflicted, even emotionally, down through these many years. We take great courage from the Word of God that God is our refuge and strength. He's a very present help in the day of trouble. But we will not think that it's disrespectful I, if there are those who can't stand for the silence. But we're going to unite as we sing our opening hymn, O oh God, our help in ages past. Then we'll remain standing for silence, and then we will have prayer.
the very fact that the eternal God is our refuge and underneath are your everlasting arms. We thank you that there is a river, the streams are off shall be glad of the city of God. We thank you that thou art the one today who inhabiteth eternity, your ways are past fending out. And our Father, we pray for those who still carry the scars of war and we realise that there are many that led down their lives who paid the ultimate sacrifice during the two great world wars and also Father in more recent wars and in our recent troubles here even in Northern Ireland. And there are many this morning will be stopping and reflecting upon the past. And we do humbly say thank you. Lord, we thank you to be living in a land that we can still experience a measure of religious tolerance and freedom. Thank you that the gospel is still being proclaimed. We know that there's many countries we've been reading this week about North Korea and how Christians, even though there's so few there, are being tormented and afflicted. And like many other countries today, there's not the freedom that we enjoy. And Lord, I just pray that you might have it even in the years to come, if you spare and tarry. Those, Father, who still physically carry the wounds of war, and those who emotionally have been afflicted, I just pray that you'll draw graciously near to all such. We remember our land today with all its need, Lord. We remember those that are in government and I just pray that you might be pleased to raise up those who will stand by the word of God. And we realise, Lord, that your eyes run to and fro throughout the whole world. And I just pray that as you look down, that in wrath remember mercy. And we thank you that even on this remembrance someday we can remember the one who suffered the just for the unjust that he might spring us to God. Pray, dear Father, that you will bless our land today, and bless our nation. Turn us again that thy people may rejoice in thee. Remember too these days that we're living in, whenever this world is being greatly affected because of this recent virus. Lord, I pray that men and women might stop and reflect and consider their latter end. <coughs> Realising that it's appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Bless those, Father, the congregation who cannot be with us this morning. Be with them, undertake for them, for those that are in hospital. You know each one. And I just pray that you will answer prayer, even on their behalf. For those that are working in difficult circumstances today, in the health service and in other fields, I just pray, Lord, that you will give strength and grace. And we continue to remember those who have lost loved ones. We pray, Father, that standing somewhere in the shadows, that they may see the Lord Jesus. As we turn to the Word of God shortly, bless your word to each of our hearts. Bless your Alistair as he shares the children's story. And grant, Lord, that in everything, that you will be glorified. In your name we pray. Amen. We do thank you again for coming this morning. Whenever I was out walking yesterday, I saw a man walking a dog, I don't know who he was, but uh, it was such a beautiful day, it was like summertime, and he said to me, he said, isn't it great to be alive? And isn't it really great to be alive this morning and to be able to gather in the Lord's house? And of course our thoughts for those who can't. The announcements for the coming week are prayer meeting on Thursday at 8 p.m., Lifeline is on Friday 6.30, and the Lord's Day service is 10.30, the Sunday School of the Bible class, and 11.30 and 7 p.m. We know that there are Christians today, uh, obviously in the province and a few further field, that are praying today, especially with regard to the coronavirus and those who have been affected by it. And I would encourage you, if you're linked with the Christian Institute, to listen to the seminars. Uh, you, I think it's uh, Reverend Turnbull, my yeah, pronunciation is right. 
and he's speaking about leadership and it was very, very interesting. I intend to listen to it again, uh, the one that he had on Monday night. But he covers about the Spanish flu and how 50 million died. He covers about the potato famine and how many people died. And I, um, he makes a statement, and you may agree with it or you may not agree with it, but I think it's a very, I, um, it's a big statement. He said the reason why there is so much fear today with regard to the coronavirus, and he's looking back to the past and past history, and many has lost their lives in the past, and he said he reckons that there's so much fear today because there's so little fear of God. And we know that in this world of ours, we have a, obviously a new president that will be in America. He'll take a different view on a lot of things. And I, God alone knows what the future really holds for everyone. But it's good to know that our lives are in the hands of the Almighty God. So do pray if you get a chance. I put the notice on the notice board. I just encourage the people to spend two hours or if they can or whatever time that they can, even on this Lord's Day, to pray about the virus. I think that's very good advice. Very good advice, whoever has thought up of this special day for that. Well, we're going to turn shortly to our series on Nehemiah. But before we do that, we're going to stand our blessed step brother and we'll sing our next hymn which is you're the word of god the father <laughs> the word of God with you this morning. We're going to read from Nehemiah and chapter 7. Nehemiah and chapter 7. Now, if you've glanced through this chapter, I, I'm sure you'll not expect me to read it. I, all the complicated names and all that are there. And so we're just going to read a few verses. 
Nehemiah 7 and verse 1. Now it came to pass when the wall was built and I had set up the doors and the porters and the singers and the Levites were appointed that I give my brother Hananiah and Hananiah the ruler of the palace charge over Jerusalem for he was a faithful man and feared God above many. And I said unto them, Let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun be hot. And while they stand by, let them shut the doors and bar them, and appoint watches of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, every one in his watch and every one to be over against his house. Now the city was large and great, but the people were few therein, and the houses were not built. And my God put it into mine heart to gather together the nobles and the rulers and the people that they might be reckoned by genealogy. And I found a register of the genealogy of them which came up at the first and found written therein. We'll end there at verse 5. Though my Bible does have a word pronunciation I, uh, where the emphasis is in a word, I'm not going to go into that. I've been reading all the genealogy of these different people. I was thinking of a title for my message this morning, and I thought there's probably a number of titles that I could give to it. And you will know if I get to the end of my message today as to how I arrived at this title. I want us this morning to look at the subject the importance of gatekeepers. And I'm going to refer that in a spiritual sense as to how we have to keep the gates of our lives, our thought life, our ears, our tongues, and so on. But we'll come back to that hopefully a little later on in the service today. I suppose if I was looking for Other titles I could entitle this about making our lives count for eternity. And we have been referring as to how Nehemiah has been called of God to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and the gates that were burnt with fire. Nehemiah is all about building a wall around Jerusalem. As told in the first six chapters of the book, the people have existed solely, it would seem, for the wall, they give their time, their talents, their treasures to make it possible for the wall to be rebuilt around Jerusalem. But the remaining chapters of Nehemiah from chapter 7 on, there Nehemiah is dealing with the importance of not so much even the wall being built now because the wall is built, but the remaining chapters are focusing on the wall existing for the people. It's not about the wall, but it's about what goes on inside, behind the wall. And so our focus is going to come away from the first six chapters that we've been looking at, and we have covered many aspects of the rebuilding of the wall, and those nobles who wouldn't put their hearts into the work of the building those that were extremely critical about the building and so on. But we've been reading here that the wall is now built. And so the city was in ruins. They had a wall to prevent invasion. But inside the wall there was only rubble. And they are supposed to live and they're supposed to worship there. And so there's a lot more of activity and work that's going to have to take place. They have a grand vision of what it could be once again inside the walls for the glory of God. And so in chapter 7, Nehemiah is organizing uh, the people. He's a master at administration. He knows how to work with people. He knows what makes people tick as such. He's a tremendous organizer and he certainly is a very noted leader. But it's not enough that he has built the wall. These people need their lives back. And there are many today in a spiritual sense, and their lives are shattered, 
by many different things that perhaps has come into lives and so on, but the day comes whenever we need to get our lives back together again. And so Nehemiah had a team, but in Nehemiah's team, there was more against Nehemiah than what were for Nehemiah. But the fact of the matter was that that didn't stop him fulfilling the call of God upon his life. He kept focused on what God had called him to do. And as a result, really, from chapter 7 on again, he has left us this journal. He has faced more days of trouble in his life than he has of victory. The truth is that we will face many enemies along the way of life. And we have looked at many of them in Nehemiah's day. We've looked at the methods that you will need to be ready to recognize the methods that are used by the enemy. We've covered that of criticism. Remember there was Tobiah and Sambalat, and they said that even if a fox goes up on top of the wall, it's so ridiculous what you're doing, the wall will tumble down. We have looked also at gossip in the ranks of his followers. We have also dwelt in more recent times on how he faced personal temptation. He faced slander. He faced private intimidation and public threats. And every time they were meant to induce fear into his life. But what did he do? He kept focused on his calling. And we've been emphasizing, dear friends, that even in these days of uh, what's happening in this world of ours, it's very easy for us to lose focus. Very, very easy to. But we must maintain our focus. We must look to the Lord Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. The wall got completed in 50 two days and whenever I was going through this earlier in the week I thought they built the wall quicker than we were building the extension and I know that the builder might be listening but I, that's just maybe we've been quite up front about things anyway but in 52 days the wall was built and the leader and the people he oversaw could celebrate the completion of and I also God's protection and God's hand in the building of the wall. And it's always good to look out for the hand of God upon our lives and guiding us and instructing us and bringing people into our lives to encourage us and to help us even along life's journey. But uh, the people are now celebrating. For some, this was a very memorial part of the story. But it's good to recognize that there's still a number of chapters for us to work through. And I know that especially the first few verses of chapter 7 are the ones that we'll be focusing on and not on all the genealogy. We'll be leaving a lot of that aside. Have you ever stopped and asked yourself, what is life all about? You get up each day, you wash your face maybe, you get ready, you go out, you do your job, and uh, you seek to put bread on the table and so on. But have you ever asked yourself, really, what is life all about? How can I make the most from my life? Or what am I accomplishing in my life that will really count whenever I'm no longer around here? Believe it or not, Nehemiah answers these important questions. The chapter teaches us that there's a number of things that are very important in our lives. And I'm going to leave them with you today if we get through them as to what really is important in our lives. There's many things that are, but I'm going to highlight just a few. The first one is to worship God. If someone's getting through life and they don't know Christ as their Saviour, They have no hope beyond the grave. They're floating aimlessly through this world of ours. Well, then they're going to be, of all men, most miserable as it were. Chapter 7 and verse 1 tells us, Now it came to pass, when the wall was built, 
And I set up the doors and the porters and the singers and the Levites were appointed. And he's dealing here with worship. Nehemiah mentions that after the walls were rebuilt and the doors were installed, he appoints these gatekeepers, these singers and these Levites. Most commentators say that these worship leaders were also assigned the duty of keeping or guarding the city gates. The reason for protecting the city from invaders was not just so that everyone could live securely, uh, securely, but primarily it was so that God uh, could be worshipped in the temple again and that God could be honoured. We see the importance of the gatekeepers with the singers and the Levites. And singing is important in worship. And I know that there are very diverse views in our land here and also in the nation and elsewhere with regard to singing, that there are many views. But singing has always been very important in worship, in worshiping God. And Paul makes reference to it even there in the book of Ephesians. Now, Nehemiah understood the people of Jerusalem needed more than walls and gates. Do you ever feel down? I say that we're not normal if we don't at some time in our lives. You feel down. You feel under the weather as it were. Well, perhaps if you start singing or quoting to yourself the word of God, you will, as Nehemiah says later on in the chapter, you will encourage yourself then in the things of God. And so the walls are contained, they're protected, they identified the people, but that wasn't enough. They needed the life of God in that city and in their own hearts. And how this morning, dear friends, we need the life of God dwelling within us, the Holy Spirit taking up a residence in our lives that we might be able to express our gratitude and our gratefulness to God for all his love towards us. It's the same with the body of believers. It's the same with the church of Jesus Christ. We can build, we can remodel a facility, we can get new walls, we can get new technology, but we need a move of God and surely that is tremendous. Uh, the tremendous need even of our nation today is for a move, a turning back again to the paths of righteousness. If we don't preach the word of God, then we have absolutely nothing left for us. And so Nehemiah, we're told in in chapter 7 and verse 67, he appoints 245 men and women singers. That was a big choir. Uh, There was the worship leaders. They were told that there was a band. There was the spiritual worship and prayer and praise to the Lord. I'm sure that there are those of you that are familiar I know it was used as a pop song many years ago, but it was the Word of God. I don't know why it was ever brought into the pop world. It was that lovely psalm by the rivers of Babylon where we sat down. And there we wept when we remembered Zion. That, of course, is the Word of God. And that's talking about the children of Israel and how that they hung their harps in the willows They said, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? They hadn't sung because they'd been in exile. They were captives in Babylon, but they're now home, and Nehemiah wants them to learn how to worship God again. They were home because God had kept his word. He delivered them. And it's now time to sing the Lord's song again. In chapter 12, at the dedication of the wall, Nehemiah has a couple of choirs going, we're told. You can read it a little later on in the chapter. They were assigned to give thanks to God for God's faithfulness. One walked on the wall with the musicians playing, while the other choir walked in the opposite direction. But the one goal was to exalt God for God's mercy and God's goodness. Worship became part of their lives, expressing praise and thanks to God. And so the Levites were appointed to teach and to explain the law of God 
to the people. And chapter 8 and chapter 9 tells us about Ezra. He reads the law to the people. Whenever the word of God was being read, the people stood up. In our culture, usually we stand whenever we're singing and we sit when we're reading the word. But it was different uh, back in these days of Nehemiah. They stood up, we're told, and they heard, and they, they heard the word of God read from daybreak until noon. We need to keep in our minds that these folks either had been in exile or else they were born to parents who had been in exile from the land. They had been without the temple. They had been without sacrifice. There was much they didn't know about keeping the law. Nehemiah talks about the Levites instructed the people in the law of God. It's very important for us these days to lay tremendous emphasis upon the law. Now, I have heard Christians, I've talked to some of them, and a number of them have told me that they're not happy in some of their churches that the Word of God is not being taught at present to their children. And they feel that children are being neglected. And, of course, for whatever reason, well, I've said to others before God, I honestly couldn't see schools open and Sunday school closed. I think that couldn't be right. That's my thinking anyway. And some have said to me, we only get a wee slot. And that's all you get to teach your children the Word of God. It's a wee slot in their lives. And then they're up. And they're gone. It's very, very important to hear the Word of God. So Nehemiah has built the walls, but that wasn't enough. He wants the people to live according to the law of God. He wants them to experience more than just the safety of the walls. He wants them to experience the blessing of God associated with living in obedience to the Word of God. He wanted them to know how to apply the Word of God to everyday living. And dear friends, if we fail to do that, well then I imagine we have failed. To apply the Word of God to our lives. Now, those of you that read UCB, I'm going to quote the King James Version because that's the version that, uh, that I use. I, if you were reading from the King James Version this morning, uh, the text is, Withdraw thy foot from thy neighbor's house, lest he be wearied with thee. And there's a whole list of things I'm not saying in our culture will do them. Ten things that you do whenever you're visiting or you're not visiting and so on. I don't think really many of us would go down that. But I remember many years ago in this church preaching in that text. And I wonder to myself, why am I preaching on it? Withdraw thy foot from thy neighbor's house, lest he be wearied with thee. My thoughts were well. It's an unusual text to preach on. You know, someone told me just sometime after that service that that text was directed for them. They took it on board. Now, I wasn't aware of their situation, but they obviously were. And I'm just saying this, dear friend, today, we've got to apply the Word of God to our lives. Our country is full of being taught the Word of God, and we ought to appreciate that and be thankful for it. But we must go further. It is how the Word of God affects my living. How it affects my life. It's more than getting the walls and the gates in place. It's allowing Jesus, it's allowing the Holy Spirit to bring life inside these walls that others will see something of Christ living within us. Assuming we've got the walls and the gates in place, I come to what I really, were, I really want to go today, and that is, have you appointed gatekeepers in your life? Are you monitoring who and what is coming in through the gates of your life today? Are you reading and applying God's Word to your life and to your individual circumstances this morning? New walls, new gates... Now it's time for a new way of living. It's time to get serious with God about your Christian life. And there are some that I'm going to make reference to. The first one is about faithfulness. Faithfulness to God. 
Nehemiah knew in order to be an effective leader, he needed to delegate responsibility to others. And so he chose as here two men. There's not a lot of difference in their names. There's one Hanani, who was probably his blood brother, who had come to him as Shusha with the report of Jerusalem's sad condition in chapter 1. And then there's Hananiah, and he was appointed as the military leader because he was faithful and he feared God above so many others. The godly threats in their lives, there was faithfulness. What does that word mean? The Hebrew word, I understand, means reliable. Always dependable. You could bank your life on. Another rendering is truthful. Another one is firm. Hananiah was a man you could depend upon. So Nehemiah tells us here. He spoke the truth and if he promised something, he sought to do it. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. Faithfulness is an essential ingredient in any relationship. I was reading yesterday where a a leader in a very large fellowship where he lost his job, he's a pastor, in a very big, the Hillsong Church, if any of you don't know anything about it, not that I know much about it, but he lost his job and then he put out a statement about his unfaithfulness to his wife. It shows the picture of him, his wife, and his children. I say this, dear friends, today, that here was a man here, and he was faithful. And faithfulness is an essential ingredient in a relationship. Now, a relationship is a two-way process. It's a two-way thing. One can't do all the giving and the other do all the taking. No, it's two-way. If there's not faithfulness in a relationship, if you do not trust someone, you will never get close to that person. You'll always keep your distance. You'll always have your guard up. And the second thing that I want to point out here is the fear of God, we're told. Here was a man who feared God more than many. John Knox and his tombstone, John Knox, the great reformer of the 16th century, on his tombstone are these words, He feared man so little because he feared God so much. The third thing that I want to point out is not only faithfulness and the fear of God, but there is also watchfulness. The Amai not only built the wall with the sword and the trial, he has also posted these guards and give careful instructions on how to guard the city. And in the spiritual sense, dear friend, in all our lives we have to have spiritual guards. Guard keepers. On each occasion, the gatekeeper here were... I uh, have a very important role to do. And one is watchfulness. That was one of the duties of the guard. I suppose we have to be thankful to God that we've had the privilege of seeing a bit of the world. But all of you used to say to me a few years ago, there's one place I'd love to go to. And I said to her, well, if you're going... Count me out, because I wouldn't have any interest. He says, I'd love to go to the Great Wall of China. Love to go there. I, I wouldn't have any interest, but I don't know what you know about the Great Wall of China, but the Great Wall of China is the only man-made object visible from space. It was built to keep the enemy out, and it has only been penetrated four times. And you know how the enemy got in? He got in through the gate. That's how he got in. On each occasion, the gatekeepers were either bribed or else they were asleep. And that's how the enemy got in. Isn't it so often, as Solomon talks about, we have to watch the little foxes that spoil 
the vines. The important thing is the gate is only as good as the character of the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper controls who or what goes into the city, what enters through the gate. Oh, a very, very important uh, role. If the gatekeeper is asleep on the job, or if he can be brave to let the wrong people or the wrong things into our lives, we're in serious trouble. We need gatekeepers to control what comes into our lives. The gates of our life and of our soul are very easily identified. Our minds. Paul said, whatsoever things are true, lovely, etc., etc., think on these things. What comes in through our emotions, what comes in through our senses, our eyes, our ears, our nose, our taste, our touch. How we have to keep guard. These are essentially the means by which things enter into our lives. So let me ask us a question this morning. What are you allowing into your life today? Think about the gates of your life. Do you allow rebellion or other things into your life that's going to hinder your spiritual walk? Do you feed your soul on absolute nonsense, maybe more so than on the Word of God? Think about the gates of your life. What are you allowing in through your eyes and through your, your ears today? What do you watch, what do you listen to? Have you positioned adequate and appropriate gatekeepers in your life today? Or may I ask, are you allowing negative, corrupting things to enter into your heart that is stealing away the good seed of the Word of God? Entering in through your mind, through your thought life? Who or what are you allowing into your life that influences and controls your choices and your decisions? What do you allow in that shapes your thinking? Because as a man thinketh in his life, we're told, so is he. Are you more careful about what you put into your mind than what you put into your body? Oh, there's plenty of emphasis today on maintaining the body and our health and what we eat and exercise and all those things. And those things are important. But it's very important about the mind. We need gatekeepers in place in our lives. If we're allowing destructive and negative and fearful thoughts to pass through the gates of our, uh, on, uh, of our, our minds unhindered, we're going to suffer as a result of it. Remember the things that are true, just, and so on. We need gatekeepers in our lives to stop these things entering in at the gate. Verse 3 we read, And I said unto them, Let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened unto the sun, be hot. And while they stand by, let them shut the doors, and bar them, and appoint watches of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, every one in his watch, and every one to be over against his house. Are there things that you're allowing into your life right now that you know are having a detrimental effect upon you and upon others? Check the gatekeepers. We know there was 172 men that were appointed gatekeepers. There was more men than gates. And so the wall was going to be well guarded and protected. And I'm going to conclude here because my time's almost up and I'm going to keep to my word again this morning. I want to suggest in closing some of those very important gatekeepers in our lives. The first one is the Word of God. If something else is, is, is jamming out the Word of God from our lives, we need to check it. The first is the Word of God. The second is the Holy Spirit. We need His presence in our lives. He convicts of sin and righteousness and judgment to come. And the third Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 4 is the peace of God that passeth all understanding. Oh, may God help each one of us to guard our spiritual lives today. We're going to sing in conclusion... Two verses of our closing hymn, 
I want my life to be.